well, praise God, everyone from whom all blessings flow. We just love the Lord today. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to get started with this wonderful lesson today. God, we bless you and thank you. We honor you today, God, for being a God almighty. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for giving us a mind stayed on you today, God. We love you. We adore you. As we teach this word, oh God, give us the rhema word, the word that we need on today to empower, enlighten, and enrich us. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. This lesson today, living as God's just people. Praise God. It's come from Leviticus chapter 9, verses 9 through 18. And then it's going to drop down to verse 33 through 37. The Bible truth, we should love our neighbor as we do ourselves. And we're going to talk about the memory verse, which is Leviticus 19 and 34. We're going to talk about that a little later. But we thank God for this word today. Now, the book of Leviticus is almost completely concerned with rules and regulations that the Lord handed down to Moses to give to the Israelites. Some of the commandments uh, contained in this chapter appear to have no relevance to the contemporary Christian. But we have to be careful that we think like that. We are we we should look at the word of God as applicable to our lives every day, every day. Praise God. So. For example, you be inclined to think that the command you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing Deuteronomy 25 and 4, you would think that would be irrelevant for us today. But what Paul did, he applied it to the to today's as an underlying principle of this command. He said, uh, talked about the payment of those who preach. So he was saying, do not neglect it. Do not neglect giving the preachers what they're due. So things seem like they're old to us, but if you look at the word and just let God give you some revelation, God will give you revelation about that word. Now, this lesson is a brief introduction to what the Bible says about how to properly help the poor and how to pro how to properly treat the handicapped individual and consistent standards for business. So we're going to see the focus of today's lesson deals primarily with Israel's horizontal relationships with others, particularly addressing justice and fairness as an example of holiness. And God said, I am the Lord, and I am the Lord your God, which tells us that God, excuse me, has the right to tell us what to do. And we're going to see that. And these two expressions, I am the Lord and I am the Lord your God, occurs 15 times in 37 verses of this particular chapter. Although we might not read all of them, we do know that it's going to occur 15 times in this particular chapter. Verse 9 through 10. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corns of the field. Neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of the harvest, and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard. Neither shalt thou gather every grape of our vineyard, and thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. This is one of the public assistance programs in Israel. <laughs> Israel's law recognized that the poor was going to be always among them. Jesus even said it. And so what God did, he provided a means for their survival. So when the Israelites, when they first got to the promised land, every family was allotted, a, uh, they was allotted some land in order to produce crops or raise animals. For whatever reasons though, some families and individuals did not succeed in their land and they lost control of their land and, and they became poor and uh, dependent on others. So these poor who no longer had uh, land of what I wish to plant and harvest a crop by God's law were given the opportunity to harvest in specific areas in the fields of those who had succeeded. And so these successful farmers were commanded by God to set aside areas in their fields for the poor to uh, to work and to have food. So in this way, they avoided becoming a hardship to the nation. So God commanded the farmers to have a generous heart and the poor to be active and to work for their food. So by gleaning the corns and the leftovers of the field, the, the, the poor were spoiled, they were uh, they were spared, excuse me, the embarrassment of asking for charity. So in addition, this was God's way for the poor to provide for their own needs with both work and with dignity. I love it. So God gave them three agri agricultural practices. They were to leave the corns of the fields unharvested. They were not together all that fell to the ground. Even the stalks that were missed when the, when the sheaves were bound were to be left for the poor. Even if a sheep was left in the field by mistake, it was not to be picked up later. That's Deuteronomy 24 and 19. And some fruit was always to be left for the poor, the Israelites. That's what that's who the poor were. And then the stranger, that was a foreigner coming in who could not possess the land of his own in the land of Israel. Who he couldn't get it. So God said for the poor and the stranger. Deuteronomy 24 and 21. So farms were, were to allow the poor to come into the field 
and hobs for themselves, whatever was left. And Ruth and Naomi were two people who benefited from this law. The third thing, they were not to completely harvest all the grapes from a vineyard. And so those Israelites who made business was agriculture were taught in this way to show concern for the needed. And think about it. God was a true owner of the land anyway, so he could tell his servants what the, he, he should tell them how to manage his property for the well-being of everyone. Now, it was permissible to go into a neighbor's field or vineyard before the harvest and pick enough to satisfy your hunger. But it was not legal to carry away any fruit in a container or to cut off any grain with a sickle. And so by this combination of owners, generosity, and the poorest labor, their basic needs were to be met. And this was not only current given to the poor in Israel, but it was also a command that every three years be a specific special tithe collected for the, re the relief of the poor. If the church would just go back to doing some of this thing, some of this stuff, some people wouldn't be home. But anyway. This is what they did during this time. We can still do it today because we most people make enough money to give something to the poor. All right. Verse 11 through 13. You shall not steal, neither dare falsely, neither lie to one another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shall not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him is him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night and until morning. So in these verses, many practices are forbidden. We see they are false practices, false oaths, that's, <clears throat> which are designed to win trust on the false pretensions and fail to pay workers properly and in a timely manner. Now, cutting corners and lying and cheating, uh, defrauding others, all these may seem advantageous at a particular moment in time. But if you think about it, these practices almost always make victims out of others. So, and also among these verses are some things that, that a common sense should tell us to do good or to, to avoid. And it might seem obvious, but laws against committing perjury still in line are sometimes hard to obey uh, when the boundaries are less clear. So when the cases are obvious, the trust between right and wrong is clear. But often deception and deceit and fraud can take very subtle and easily um Justified forms, because even the poor and the rich can can be tempted to steal or deal false with others and tell lies for a different reason. The poor could say in their minds, "They're this, they're, this is their this unto to survive." So I got to I got to be this on so I can survive. When God had made provision for them to work, and the rich and powerful could say. They could be justified in their minds to remain rich and powerful when God expected them to treat all people fairly and dishonest and honestly and be concerned for the needs of others. So the rich could say one thing and the poor could say one thing. But God is saying all of it is wrong. And so we know that this is the uh, the eighth commandment prohibiting theft and, and explain more fully because he includes, <clears throat> excuse me, adding neither either adding neither deal falsely. So deceitful deals are intended to take advantage of a person, getting from him some material or psychological benefit to which one is not entitled. And so this is stealing, whether done in overtly or, or indirectly, it's still stealing. So add to this, to this prohibition is neither lie one to another. So stealing and lie go hand in hand. My mom used to always say, if you lie, you're still. She would always say that to me. And it said, you should not swear by, by the name false, and neither shall thou profane, be disrespectful, or be, be blasphemous, the name, uh, blasphemous, the name of thy God. Now, it's bad to tell a lie. But it's much worse to swear or to vow or guarantee and give your word with God's name. You can't take God's name lightly. And I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. When Jacob deceived I, deceived Isaac in order to get Esau's blessing, so what he did, he said, when Isaac asked him, "How'd you get it so quick?" He said, "Because the Lord, the, the Lord thy God, brought it to me." Genesis 27 20. So he did not just lie about the source of the meat. He profaned God's name in doing so. So to swear falsely by his name was to disregard the holiness of God's name and, 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 and is invoked as an insurance of the truth. And his people say, I, you know, it's I swear before God. Why you got swear before God? Just tell me yay or nay. The Bible said just be let it be yay or let it be nay. So also God said in, in his in the word, he said, do not hold back. 
the person's wage. And the main reason was because these people were poor people. If you read, get a chance to read Deuteronomy 24 verses 14 and 15, it emphasizes the workers' poverty and need. In other words, these people work day by day so they could eat at night. So if you withhold their money to the next day even, then they might starve to death that they might starve that night. And so Jesus, was, the Bible also was saying not only pay them, but pay them in a timely way. This is what he was saying here. So the principle is that you keep your word and don't take advantage of your employees by holding on to their wages for your own benefit. And this is what it's saying. It also emphasizes that it makes no difference whether the work is an Israelite or a foreign. It does not matter. Verse 14, thou shalt not curse the Lord. That means, excuse me, curse to death, nor put a stomach block before the blind, but shall fear the Lord, thy God, I am the Lord. So Israel laws also condemn those who dishonor the infirm. Thou shalt not curse the death. And the reason this was so bad, because the deaf cannot hear the curse. And give, and he couldn't even give a response. Because, you know, when somebody says something over you and you don't like, you say, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. But I heard it. But a deaf person cannot hear it. So the <laughs> So the curse, that, that's very cowardly to do that to a deaf person because they can't give you a response. So the appearance and behavior of the handicapped may seem strange, but mockery betrays a callous heart. Exodus 4 and 11. And so this verse should literally be taken as placing an object that when it says by putting a stumbling block before the blind, that should be that should be taken literally for a person to stumble and fall. That's what they're saying. So we can hardly imagine a more heartless act. It would be done only for one self-centered amusement because people are so cruel. Now, the main, the ultimate thing about this is this. This is the ultimate thing. The ultimate issue is not how we treat the infirm. Get this. If you don't get anything else out of this lesson. But our attitude toward the, the, the God who made them. Because God made them. So the attitude is bad. So you got to be careful how you treat God's people. And also, God sent this law out to correct bad theology. Because it was a common uh, common thing, and still exists today, for people to think that if someone had a physical disability, such as being deaf or blind, then that person, then that person was specifically, specially cursed by God. So, th th and, and think about it, just the fact that this command was even necessary shows us the kind of people that Israelites had become after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Their cruel environment made cruelty seem normal to them. And so God's saying, this got to change. Verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness to, in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor. No, I'm the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor. So God demands that his people uh, know injustice or unrighteousness. That's what he, com he demands that from us in their judgments and their legal decisions. People are to be treated fairly regardless of their social standing. Now, we know it's more common to I'm the person of the mighty. That's what we do. Than it is to be partial to the poor. But they are both sins in God's eyes because they are both for injustice. If I treat the other person, now think about it. If God has no respect of a person, then neither should we be a respect of a person. So the unrighteousness could take the form of either showing partial as to the poor or giving unmerited deference to the powerful. We got to look at it. Jesus reminds us in this that what this principle is all about. We should only judge others. With the standard we are willing to be judged by. Because God would apply the same standard to us. That's Matthew 7 verses 1 through 12. If you get a chance, go back and read it. So be careful how you judge one, how we judge people. Because that same standard will come back to you. Verse 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a tail bearer among the people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Now, another, you know, I told you once before, it's like 15 times it occurs. It's another instance. I am the Lord. So up and down here means to go about. And Proverbs 18 and 8 says it this way about a talebearer. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. So this is a commandment from God that thou shalt not. So a talebearer is essentially a gossip person, someone who cannot mind their own business. And First Thessalonians 4 and 11 says it, and they and that you start to be quiet and to do your own business. So they're telling you, hush your mouth and don't be a tail bearer. And these are people who delight 
in discussing the lives of others and, and spreading stories. And so it should be it should be understood here as a slanderer. So you got to be careful because sometimes a false accusation and false witness can actually endanger another person's life. But when a false charge is, is upheld, the accused may be executed. So we got to be careful. Even though we sometimes we think it's true, you don't you don't do tail bearing. Tail bearing he missed a threefold purpose. I'm gonna tell you what happens when you're a tail bearer. It injures the teller, who is you, it injures the hero who is the other person and it also ends the ends the person that you're talking about so just think about it like that whether it's true or false we are by his priest by the precepts of god's word forbidden to spread it and so the reputation of the lord's the reputation excuse me of the lord's people should be very precious in our sight now this is the problem with slander and gossip this is the issue that we ought to recognize it when it's directed toward us that's when i know oh, they, they're gossiping on me but when I'm doing it, I don't see this gospel slander. What I this is how I see it. I'm just saying. So so this so we can get so we can get to pray. I just, I need you to pray for these people. So I'm just telling you, this ain't gossip now. I'm just telling you what happened. That's what I'm doing to you right now. I'm just telling you. So how how can here's now here's how you can tell whether or not it's gospel. Let me tell you, let me show you how. I'm gonna move on. I got so much. I hope I don't go past my 30 minutes. But if I do, it won't be much past. But if they knew, think about it this way. If you if you want to know whether or not it's gospel, okay. If they knew what you were about to say, would they call it gospel? Okay. If they knew why you were about to say it, would they call it gossip? And if they knew what would happen once it was said, would you call it gossip? What, why, and happen? What would happen should tell us whether or not we should it should be should we tell it? And you'd be surprised at how much of what we say about other people won't stand up to the what, why, or, or what happened. So God's reminder, I am the Lord, again declares that such behavior utterly contradicts his nature. So he therefore refuses to tolerate this particular behavior. Mm. And so God commands us to promote and protect the lives of those around us. And we have no excuse to be indifferent to the loss of life. Verse 17 through 18. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, and thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against thou, uh, the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God says again, I am the Lord. Now, so far, the lesson text has forbidden certain external practices that are inconsistent with God's nature, but now we found a recognition that the root problem of this act is internal. And until this is remedied, that sinful practice will continue. So the prohibition in verse 17 explains the motivation that made the command in verse 16 necessary. So a person should not harbor hatred for a neighbor in his heart. And love will now get this. Now love will rebuke another when it's necessary. So it don't mean you don't rebuke people. But this does not mean overlooking a brother's fault. You can still rebuke them with love, though. So rebuking someone for sin is actually doing them a favor. It's actually blessing them for it may rescue him from God's judgment like that. And it's also a favor to oneself. And this way to avoid letting hatred build up is to confront the person. And so ideally, this would, excuse me, <clears throat> Ideally, this would involve resolving the issue face to face. However, it could be uh, involved taking the issue to court. So whatever the way is, you can for still you can still forgive a person. You can go to court on them, you but you still can forgive them without having anything in your heart. So the heart is the fountain of good and evil. Matthew 12 and 35, Matthew 15, verses 18, 1 and then through 19. So our heart needs to be cleansed. Because the Bible said the heart is wicked. Who can know it? It's desperately wicked. Hmm. And he said, not suffer sin upon him. What he's saying with that particular verse is the idea of not bringing sin upon yourself because of him. So that's what they that's what that means, and not suffer sin upon him. So by remaining silent about his sin, we become partakers in it. Huh. So it's appropriate to it's appropriate to both personally forgive the criminal and testify against them in court. So you can do you can you can do both. Now about avenging, uh Deuteronomy 32. And 35, Romans 12 and 9, Hebrews 10 and 30. When you get a chance, read it. Because it's easy to, ch to cherish a grub against another. 
but too much damage is done to the one holding the grudge. So get, vengeance is the prerogative of God alone. I just gave you the scriptures when you get a chance to read it. So the significance of verse 18 is highlighted by the fact that Jesus and Paul both cited this verse as a summary of the duties one has to fail a man. You read Matthew 22 verses 39 through 40 and then Romans 13 and 9, you'll see that this, this is what Jesus said and Paul said about it. So Jesus called loving thy neighbors thyself the second command. Get a chance to read it. Verses 33 through 34. Dropping down. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, you shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thou self. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Here God says again, I am the Lord your God. I love it. Once again, the Lord sealed his command with his stamp of authority as the Lord their God. He keeps saying this. He keeps saying this. So this section of the lesson singles out specific areas in which compassion is to be practiced. The first is fair treatment of a resident stranger in Israel. So in addition to providing a place for the poor to work, because we read that earlier, God's law provided a place for non hebrew people to work as well. Now God's law applied to strangers as well as citizens, and God expected that strangers to abide by the laws of the promised land the same as Israelites. And if a stranger came to live or stop over in the Israelites' land, they were to treat the stranger living among them just like they would treat any other by not vexing, not irritating, or mistreat him. That is, in other words, don't do him wrong. They are to be welcomed because guess what might happen? They might be brought to the knowledge and the worship of the true God just by your life. We say it all the time in today's language. Sometimes we're the only Bible that someone reads. So the, it reads, but God, that's what I like about God. The, he tells them what to do. Then he gives them the reason why they should do it. He said, you have to love the foreigners and what they say and, and what they said to themselves has been strange. And, because you have been, excuse me. You should love the foreigner because you used to be a stranger in Egypt. So you, you, you should understand how that person feels. And this is why God said this. You know, because you were a stranger. Because we used to sing a song when I was younger. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a stranger in this weary land. Or something, that, that, those are some of the words. I can't remember the tune per se. But I remember being a stranger in, in this weary and this foreign land. So we're not, we're not here to stay. But God wants them to remember, this is what I did for you. Remember, when you were in Egypt, you were strangers. So you should know how you feel. So you should be able to treat the foreigner good because you know how you felt when you were in Egypt. Mm. Verse 35 through 36. You shall do no unrighteousness in, unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight, or in measure. Just balance, just weight, just ephod, and a just hand shall you have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So look what God did here. Unjust dealings are nowhere more common than in business transactions. And they are not to use dishonest standards and decision in three areas. And that's where a person in business can cheat a customer. First of all, it's in judgment. That means their are legal rulings or verdicts. Uh, that most apply to the judge, judges. Then in meat yard, that refers to a measuring stick. That means in their measurements. And then the weight means their bulk or mass of a thing. And measure means quantity or capacity. So he's saying you got to be honest and you got to be consistent by your standards which you measure and weights and are determined in order for just and fair commerce to exist. In other words, be honest when ruling on a matter. Weigh and measure anything in length, weight or volume. And so God is saying, I want you to be honest in these things. So God states he's so simple. He, he gives you, like I said earlier, if it's clear, you don't have no problem with right or wrong. So manufacturers, they have a right to claim profit. Now they do. But he is not to increase his measure of profit at the expense of the consumer, the public at large, or nature. So some intentionally misinterpreted God's law and the laws of God's government and look for ways to cheat without violating the Pacific in these three areas. So what I figured out, that's why a lot of people in jail right now, because they tried to figure some things out. The EFAH, the E-P-H-A-H, -E however you want to pronounce it, is taken as a standard of dry measures and the hen as a standard of liquid measures. So everything that God does is right and proper. So his people should only do things that are right and proper too. So he asks again, I am your Lord, which bringing you out of the land of Egypt. He says, I'm your Lord God. He does not want them to forget that he's the Lord their God. God declared that he's the Lord and the one with the right to tell us what to do. 
So in bringing, land, bringing Israel out of Egypt, the Lord intends to set apart a people distinguished by their likeness to him and not conform to the practices of surrounding people. So God wanted the people to himself. And that's why he kept saying, I'm the Lord your God. I'm the one that brought you out. I'm the one that did these things for you. Verse 37. Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am the Lord. He says it again. I am the Lord. So at the conclusion of these commands, the Lord directed the Israelites' minds back to the reason for them. He said, I'm the Lord. That's why I give you, I give you rules. He had a special relationship with them. So therefore, it's kind of like your children. You can't tell everybody children what to do. But I got a relationship with my own child. So this is what God is saying. I got a relationship with you all. So I'll, I'll be able to tell y'all what to do. So their behavior was to confirm, com, me, conform to his nature. Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6. So the Israelites were to understand and salute, I mean, understand statues and carry them out in a daily life. A just society must adhere to its laws in order to exist. And so the laws of Israel came from God himself, the one true God. In summary, Leviticus 19 deal with social relationships in the community, and these commandments are seen as major regulations of community relationships. So God gives all these laws with a common thought in mind. The thought is, you shall be holy, for the Lord I, your God, am holy. So these laws are given because the lawgiver is God. So you can read that's in Leviticus 19 and 4 and then 10 and 12 in this particular uh, chapter. So they're not primarily statements of authority. Do this because I tell you. He's not saying, I want you to do this because I tell you. Though some of this is included in what God is saying. But they are statements of relationship between the lawgiver and his law. And so the laws reflect his nature. The law is what because the law is what it is because God is what he is. Let me say that again. The law is what it is because God is what he, because it, excuse me. The law is what it is. Because God is what he is. I had, to, I had to get them ears and tears and all them together. So given the purpose of the book, to admonish Israel to, to, hold, to be holy just as God is holy and to give them practical directives of how to achieve it, this passage works toward achieving this purpose by answering Israel's question, how can we be holy just as God is holy? By purposely, this is what God is doing. We can't do this today, but we can do some other things. So to be holy by purposely leaving portions of a field or being y'all unharvested and allowing the poor to harvest these sexes for themselves, Israel was to be was was able to provide for the poor from their from their surplus and thus reflect the heart of their God. So in this way, they could be holy just as He is holy. And this lesson could have a secondary relevance for those outside of the church in that they, they would discover one way in which the church today should reflect God's heart for the poor. And that is the lesson for today. This lesson blessed my soul. Now I got an announcement about AIM. I want us to know, you know, AIM is coming up on the starting of June 4th through the 18th. You got your speakers, AIM, uh, Wednesday, Master, excuse me, Pastor Michael Lampkin, Thursday, Andrew Singleton, so on, Bishop Proud on Friday, Zach Hayes, Zach Hayes, hey, I own is one of the ones that's over it. And there's just so many things that are going to be going on. So if you get a chance to go, praise God, you can go down to Jackson um, from the 14th through the 18th, 17th, excuse me, 14th through the 17th. I think the 18th is like the basketball tournament. I think that Saturday is actually the tournament. So praise God from whom all blessings flow. So I, pr I appreciate you all. God bless you. I'm going to have a word of prayer and I'm going to end this lesson. God, we bless you. We thank you. We honor you. We give you glory and we give you praise. God, you are so worthy to be praised. We thank you for this word, God, that it comes to show us a better way. Show us how to live and how to talk to one another. God, we just thank you that you said love that our neighbors as ourselves. Help us, oh God, to treat our neighbor right, God. We treat ourselves right, so God, we ought to treat our neighbors the way we want to be treated. Help us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Have your way today. Get to glory and everything that be said and done on today, God. We thank you now, and we thank you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Enjoy your strong. Thank you.